It is a privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. Uh, I do not get the opportunity to do this very often, and one of the blessings I've had over this past couple of weeks as I was preparing was to hear from uh, this congregation, just the number of texts I got, the number of phone calls I got, uh, asking two questions. One, people saying that they were praying for me. Uh, that was a blessing. And the second thing was uh, people asking me, what am I preaching from? What text was I preaching from? Because they wanted to be prepared. I know from just being active around here for quite a while that there is so much effort that goes into this Sunday morning gathering. And uh, I, I know that the, that the staff, as they're preparing, uh, really thinks a lot and works hard at it. And now I know that we also have a very active membership who also puts great effort into this Sunday morning. And, uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a blessing. That's a blessing to me. Um, I don't get the opportunity to do this very often, and it seems as though every time I do, it turns out to be a humbling experience for me. I have spoken multiple times at Faith Bible Church, and it seems like every time I do, something major goes wrong. I have spoken once, and uh, my zipper was down uh, <laughs> the entire time, and now I know that look in the membership, uh, when your zipper's down, I know what that looks like. And, and I'm really cued in now to that look. Uh, I have spoken, believe it or not, with two different shoes on that didn't match. And I was told afterwards that that, that happened as well. Two weeks ago, I had the, or maybe more, I had the opportunity to baptize the Whitrocks. And uh, so I'm up there baptizing them, and they've given their testimony. And I'm about to say, you know, you're supposed to say at least, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Instead, I say, I now pronounce you. <laughs> and it was like I was marrying them. <laughs> and uh, it's, so when you fall into that kind of trap, it's hard to get out from under that. So I do appreciate your prayers this morning. And uh, I find that my shoes match. I'm all zipped up. And uh, I think that we are ready to go. Uh, I wanted to start the morning with an illustration. It's an illustration that I've heard before, and it's with regard to uh, just our Christian walk. Uh, I know that there's lots of new faces since I've used this, and so I trust that I'm not repeating myself to a lot of you. Uh, the illustrations with regard, and in fact, I was going to have a physical illustration. I was going to be holding a bicycle tire on this side, and then come over here and hold a pie on this side. But I was afraid if I did that, I'd have another humbling experience uh, with this pie falling all over our new carpet. So just imagine, as I'm speaking this morning, that I'm holding a bicycle tire. And uh, as you think about, and as I think about, uh, in our own uh, life, in our own walk, spiritual heroes, people that you would look to and say, oh, now that's someone I could pattern my life after. They seem to have it all together. They are walking in Christ, and it seems as though uh, it's evident. Uh, and I would characterize those people as what I would call wheel Christians, not real, R-E-A-L, wheel, W-H-E-E-L. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's picture a bicycle tire, and Jesus is at the hub of that tire, at the very center of their life. But that tire does not, Jesus doesn't just touch the hub. Those spokes reach out, and Jesus, in fact, impacts every area of their life. Seemingly, no area is untouched. However, when I think of my own life, and I think about uh, the, 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 the mistakes and errors that I make, and when I hear other people give testimony of their own trials as they're walking through this Christian walk, uh, I would characterize myself and the testimony of others as often something more like a pie Christian. So picture a pie. And in a pie Christian, they are pers that person is absolutely saved. Uh, they are redeemed. And Christ occupies a piece of the pie, a piece of this pie of their life Christ occupies. And in fact, there are pieces of that pie that Christ also touches. Uh, areas that are truly impacted by their salvation. But at the same time, there's pieces that are completely protected from that, that, that are not touched by our salvation. Let me give you some examples of areas where that might be true. Um, thinking of the area of personal rights. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my Jeep broke down. 
I actually didn't break down. The air conditioning went out, which is essentially broken down in Florida. And so I took my Jeep to the dealer, and I had a while-you-wait appointment. And so I had waited several hours, and I hadn't heard from anyone. And I decided to leave. I came back at the end of the day to pick up my Jeep, and they hadn't touched it yet. Nine days later, I get my Jeep back, and I get in and drive away, and the air conditioning still doesn't work. Now, I imagine if you were to talk to that service technician at the Jeep dealer, he would not characterize Mitch as uh, Christ shining through <laughs> uh, in that situation. It was something different. If you were to be in the car with me as I'm driving to work and late, and I'm in the left lane and somebody's going slow in front of me, uh, you would not characterize my attitude as, as blessing that person in front of me. It would be something different than that. It would be fairly self-centered in how I was thinking. Think in the area of relationships. Uh, who gets invited to your parties? Who do you invest in? Is it somebody that you want to have a relationship with, or is it somebody that needs a relationship? How do we think that way? How about in the area of philosophy or attitude or a way of thinking? Are all of those thoughts set apart or, or distinguished by the Word of God? Maybe it's an outright sin in our life. It's something that we are purposefully holding back from the impact of Christ, uh, protecting it. Maybe it's a self-centeredness or a self-promotion or self-esteem issue or pride issue, which often might involve our time, how we spend it, or our money, how we, what we do with that. I think the passage that we're studying this morning offers us significant insight into this tendency in our lives to not allow Christ to touch every area. We're going to be in Galatians 5 this morning, and as we study this, this passage of Scripture, I think it's important that we set some context uh, for what's going on. It's important to the message this morning. Uh, Galatians was written by Paul, and Paul had spent significant time in the region of Galatia. He had preached in many churches there, and now he was coming back to them. I would say uh, the attitude of Paul in this message of Galatians is that of maybe a, a very stern father or somebody that was very protective over the truth. The words he uses are very, very strong. Uh, this was the early days of Christianity when the church is just trying to become independent of Judaism. And there was a group called the Judaizers, and these Judaizers were getting, gaining a doctrinal foothold in the region of Galatia. Judaizers taught a corrupted gospel that required, that salvation required both salvation by grace through faith and also you had to obey the law. You had to uh, justify yourself before God. In fact, the term Judaizer means to live according to Jewish customs. A Judaizer taught that for a Christian to truly be right with God, he must conform to the Mosaic law. In fact, they, they, they emphasize circumcision in this. You see the word circumcision a lot in the book of Galatians. Uh, they promoted the idea that you first, that these Gentiles in Galatia first had to become Jewish, and then they had to live according to, by, or they had to be saved by faith. So Paul, in this book of Galatians, is very firm and passionate and uh, very direct in his language about correct doctrine here. In fact, the key verse in Galatians is Galatians 2.16, and it says this, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. What's interesting is at the same time Paul is making this passionate argument about the gospel, he's also introducing another idea. He's introducing the idea of the Holy Spirit. 
and this indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers at salvation, something that actively happens. And then he begins to hint through chapters 3 and 4 that this Holy Spirit offers something to us. Uh, it's not, he's not just there, he's doing something. And by Galatians 5, uh, that message becomes very direct. Let's read our passage together this morning. We're in Galatians 5, and we're going to be studying uh, from verses 16 through 25. Galatians 5, verses 16 through 25. It says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires are the, of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. I believe a good title for our message this morning would be How to Thrive as Believers in Christ. And as Paul is encouraging the Galatians in this idea of thriving in Christ, I believe he tells us how to do it or talks about it in four different ways. Uh, and I believe it's an encouragement to the Galatians and now to us. First, he does it through the promise of victory over sin. Second, he does it in understanding the product of the flesh. Third, in identifying the produce of the Spirit. And then finally, in God's provision for victory over sin. So let's dig in, and we'll start on point one here, the promise of victory over sin. And that's in verses 16 through 18. Throughout the book so far, Paul has defined two separate paths uh, that the Galatians could go. One was this idea of the true gospel, salvation by grace through faith. And then second, this corrupted gospel where works of the law were added in to that salvation by faith. In very much the same way, Paul now begins to address two voices that are available in the life of believers. Uh, these two distinct voices which they can choose to obey. I'm going to read this portion again so that we can talk a lot about it. Let's read uh, Galatians 5, 16 to 18, and it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The two voices or desires that are here and are presented in this section are that of the Holy Spirit and that of the flesh. First, the Holy Spirit. There's a promise in this action or this activity of the Holy Spirit in our life. And that is that He can dominate or influence our lives. And verse 16 promises that He can give us victory over the flesh or sin. 
There's also a passive promise in there, a negative promise, and that's much the same, and that is the flesh. And if the flesh is listened to, uh, that we will not have victory over sin. Both of those things are mentioned. Now, I want to make sure that we're clear, because as I was studying this, and I mentioned this idea of two voices, I think there's this vision that automatically comes to mind. And it's the vision that we have this demon on one shoulder, and that we have an angel on the other shoulder, and that we're this bewildered person in between, not sure what we're going to do. And if you're walking with that image right now, that's an absolutely wrong image. That's not what we're portraying here, something entirely different than that. And in fact, I spent probably too much time thinking through an illustration that, that, that worked, that better presented what these ideas were of, of these two voices in our life. And the best I could come up with was actually my own marriage. Um, when I was young, I got married, 21, but when I was a single man, I was uh, a, a very single. <laughs> I did things single guys did. I lived like a single guy. I acted like a single guy. My ambitions were toward being single and uh, enjoying the, 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 what singleness brought uh, to life, a lot of freedom uh, to do what I wanted to do, uh, kind of self-focused, I would almost say. Uh, then I became married. I was no longer free. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, then as I became married, uh, that changed. My focus changed. I was now a married man. I had now a wife that I was to care for and to love. I had this marriage relationship, this covenant relationship that I was now responsible for, to nurture and to cherish. Uh, now, I suppose that as a married man, I could have still lived like a single guy. Uh, people do that. Um, they do. They shouldn't, but they do. But the question is, why would I? Why would I live like a single guy as a married guy? It seems like I should be enjoying that covenant of marriage. It seems like I should be treasuring that new relationship that I have. It seems like I could, should be taking that opportunity to grow uh, my relationship with my wife. I think this is somewhat the same, and I know how these illustrations always break down, especially they break down here, because there is nothing more significant than our relationship with our Lord. And it should be so intrinsic to how we live and how it influences our life that, yes, we could live like we weren't saved. We could live like we were living under the flesh. But why would we? Why should we? We shouldn't. We should treasure that new relationship that we have. So with that in mind, in verses 16 and 18, there are two important ideas that I want to grab. First, in verse 16, it says that we are to walk in the Spirit. That's what we're encouraged to do. That's the promise. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the flesh. So what does it mean to walk? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? That is Pauline language for one's daily conduct or lifestyle. One's daily conduct or lifestyle. So, to walk in the Spirit means that I am going to go where the Spirit is going. I'm going to listen to His voice. I'm going to discern His will. I'm going to follow His guidance. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. Verse 18 uses very, very similar language, and it says that we are to be led by the Spirit. But in this, uh, in, in verse 18, he adds something. Those that live by the Spirit, or that are led by the Spirit, are not under the law. Paul is going back to these Judaizers, and he wants to make sure that everyone understands is that he's not just like backdooring in some kind of legalism here, that we're, we're still following the law, but we're doing it a different way, but that this new life is completely different. Life in the Spirit is not living under the law. It's something completely different than that. So then, the indwelling of the Spirit in the believer's life provides us the promise of victory over sin. But next, and I think very importantly, Paul starts to give us an image of what it looks like if we listen to either voice. First, he explains the product 
of walking in the flesh. And then he immediately after explains what the produce looks like of listening to the Spirit in our life. So let's touch on that second point, and that is the product of the flesh, or the work product of the flesh in our life. Let's read verses 19 to 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, there are two key words in this section that I want to touch on. The first is this idea of work, this idea of work. Uh, what is that? Um, uh, by, by word definition, we would say that work is, is the result of your employment. It's the work product. It's what people see based on what you do, or based on the effort given. Uh, when I think about this, I think about the idea of Leonardo da Vinci and his great work, the Mona Lisa. I've had the opportunity to see the Mona Lisa. It's sitting in the Louvre in France, and you actually, uh, it's difficult to see because it's only about two feet tall and about a foot and a half wide, and you can't get from me to that door back there from it because there's so many people uh, gathered around it. It's behind bulletproof glass. Uh, you can't see it very well. But I've seen pictures of it. I've seen better. <laughs> uh, and... Um, it is uh, uh, his most famous work. Um, and as people study that work, as you read about this idea of the Mona Lisa, uh, people talk about why it's so famous, why it's so important to this work product of Leonardo da Vinci. It talks about his training and his particular emphasis that he puts on shading and creating structure, bone structure, just through different shades. Uh, in his painting and what an expert he was at that. It talks about his effort, his attention to detail. They even know, I don't know how they know this, but they know how his wor this work was regarded, highly regarded, as he was painting it. People could see what he was doing and it was just, uh, uh, just a high level, high level of the training and effort that went uh, into uh, this gift of Leonardo da Vinci. Here it is much the same. We have a work product, a picture, which shows uh, the influence of the labor in our life, in this case, the flesh. And the result isn't such a pretty picture. The second word I want to go by with is the word evident. Uh, and it is the idea that the works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious in our life. Recently, I saw a co uh, this commercial on te television and it was advertising um, televisions, actually. And so what it shows was people watching golf on TV. And the golfers on TV were busy looking for golf balls. They're, a golf ball was missing in the matter of course. And the people watching the TV, watching the golf, uh, could see it. You could see the big white dot on the screen. And they're all screaming at the TV, it's right there, it's right there. And the golfers are stepping over it, stepping around it, but not seeing it. Uh, that's often how our life is, that these works of the flesh in our life are obvious, and for some reason or another, we tend to overlook them. But what Paul's telling us here is, no, these should be evident. They should be obvious in our life. The result of listening to the flesh in our life is obvious. You should see it. There's no middle ground here. We are choosing a voice, and our position sometimes can make it hard to see. So Paul provides a list of this work product of allowing the influence of the flesh in our life. This uh, list seems to fall into four categories, and I don't want this to be a sermon about word definitions here. So I'm going to breeze through this as quickly as I can, uh, these, these works of the flesh, and then we'll talk about it just a little bit. The first category would be sexual sin, and the first term he uses is sexual immorality. 
That word is pornea. It's any and all forms of illicit sexual relationships. The second word is impurity or moral uncleanness in thought, word, or deed. The third is sensuality or debauchery. This is an open, shameless, and brazen display of all these sexual acts that were just listed. Uh, this list seems to cover what we would perceive as mild sexual sin to uh, explicit sexual sin. It goes the whole route. And I'm uh, reminded as I, as, as I read that list that as Paul is uh, communicating this information to the Galatians, they were very well may have been uh, a little calloused or a little hardened, a little numb maybe uh, to the sexual sins in their lives. After all, in many of the cultures where Paul was speaking, things like uh, prostitution uh, were just readily accepted. It was just something people did. And I'm reminded that in our own culture, uh, these uh, sexual sins were also numb uh, to many of these things. We live in an incredibly charged sexual culture. Uh, the things that cross our eye gate, uh, the things that cross our ear gate, uh, the things that we just let rest in our heart are often in this category of sexual sin. They're very sexually charged. And I think Scripture is commanding us, don't be numb to those things. Be very alive, be aware of, of the sexual nature of the world that we live in. The next set of, uh, of works of the flesh that Paul mentions are in the area of religion. Uh, they're spiritual sins. Uh, the first one would be idolatry. Idolatry is the elevation of things and ideas to a level of trust or affection even to the level of God himself. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about that, but I will tell you um, that in January, I believe, we are going to be offering a seminar uh, on this subject of idolatry. We're going to spend several weeks talking about it. In addition to that, we have the idea of sorcery. Sorcery seems to be related uh, to drugs in some way and maybe drug use in a, in a religious context. After that, Paul moves to the idea of societal sins, social sins uh, that are mentioned, and I will name them, but these don't even need definition because we're so aware of these activities. Uh, the first one is enmity or hatred, strife or discord, jealousy, fits of anger or rage, rivalries or selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions or factions, and envy. This is a place where the flesh can gain a strong, strong foothold in our life. And as you think and measure uh, yourself, think of the breakdown in society that we have over these social sins, breakdown in relationships in the church, in our home, in our work, in our neighborhoods. Uh, the results of this are, are, are evident or obvious. The last two sins that he mentioned seem to be related to alcohol. The first one is drunkenness. And the second one he, word he uses is orgies, which would mean uh, probably drunken carousing, maybe being out of control. And then Paul follows this list by saying, and the like. Uh, the point being that this isn't even a complete list. He's just listing obvious things, and there's many more obvious things of the outflow of the flesh in our life. Verse 21 offers a solemn warning. And it is that those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Practicing them, uh, or that means that practicing them, or, or the idea of practicing them, or that it's an active part uh, in the life of the believer. That's what he means by that verse. So I want to give you a couple of observations here. First, uh, it's important to remember that as Paul is writing this, he is writing to Christians. He just gave a pretty negative list of the flesh, and he's writing to Christians as he's writing this. This isn't just something non-Christians struggle with. Christians struggle with this list of stuff. That's why he's telling them. And the second is, is that as we are walking through our life, these things, these ideas should be evident to us. They should be obvious uh, as we're walking through. So not only does Paul provide us with this product of the flesh as a significant measuring stick of the voice of the flesh in our life. 
he also gives us a very solid indicator of what the voice of the Spirit looks like in our life. That is our next set of verses. Uh, and we're on part three, which would be the produce of the Spirit in our life, the produce or fruit of the Spirit in our life. So Paul provides us with a list or a picture of what life in the Spirit should look like. I think one of the most significant ideas of the text this morning is the truth that there is no need for the believer in Jesus to display the works of the flesh in their life. You don't have to do it. We should never be resigned or defeated to this falsehood. Before we review the list also, there's a couple important things I'd like you to note uh, about this section of this passage. One, that this is not possible, this list, this fruit is not possible because of the inherent strength of us as individuals. It is only possible because of the work of the Holy Spirit through the believer who is in vital union with Jesus. In our scripture reading this morning, we were in John 15, and John 15, 4 and 5 supports this very idea. It says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So, by the Holy Spirit's power, we can manifest what I'm going to call these nine graces uh, in, in, in our lives. Uh, another thing I wanted to tell you is that the word for fruit here is singular. It's not plural. It's not nine different fruit. It's one fruit. In other words, that uh, these are not nine things that I work at. I am not commanded here to say, okay, I'm going to work at being gracious. I'm already good at kind, but now I'm going to work at gracious this week. That's not how this is supposed to be. These nine fruit, or this, this fruit, the singular fruit represented by these nine graces uh, should all be rising up in our life as we are walking in the Spirit, as we are being led by the Spirit. These are a result. These are not what we work at. What we work at is walking in the Spirit. The result are these nine graces or nine fruit. They're a measuring tool. Um, and they're the result of listening to the Spirit. It's a process of transformation or becoming Christ-like. So as we look at these nine graces, the first seem to be foundational, maybe habits of the mind or heart. The first word he uses is love. This is agape love. It is the love of God which he, with which he loves the world. It is a self-sacrificing love that sent Jesus to die on the cross for the sin of mankind. And it is the love that is manifest in spirit-controlled believers. The second word is joy. Joy is a deep and abiding inner rejoicing promise to those who abide in Christ. The third is peace. This is again a gift from Christ, and it is an inner repose and quietness, even in the face of adverse circumstances. It defies human understanding. The next three graces involve how we reach out to others. The first is patience. Patience is uh, defined as a, as a self-restraint, a holding back when provoked, with no thought of retaliation when treated wrongly. How about kindness? Kindness is benevolence in action, such as God demonstrated toward men. Since God is kind toward sinners, a Christian should display this same virtue. Lastly here, he says goodness. Uh, this may be thought of as both an uprightness of the soul and as an action in reaching out to others to do good, even when that good is not deserved. And then the final three are just general conduct of the believer. Well, first is faithfulness. This is the quality which renders a person trustworthy or reliable. 
like a faithful servant. Gentleness. This marks a person who is submissive to God's Word and who is considerate of others even when discipline is needed. Self-control denotes the self-mastery and no doubt primi primarily relates to curbing the fleshly impulses just described. Such a quality is impossible to attain apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. So these nine attributes are the fruit of walking in the Spirit of God. And after reading through both of these lists, I think some uh, of obvious fruit, obvious fruit of the flesh, obvious fruit of the Spirit, I think it, what Paul intended here and what we should do is self-examination. Um, uh, it's begging for it. First, are these nine fruit of the Spirit clearly evidenced in your life as you do your own self-examination? And are they growing? Do you see them rising? Um, second, is the product of the flesh or work product of the flesh in your life, as we've described it this morning, somehow convicting? Are there components of your life uh, where you are just setting those things aside, where you're protecting them, where they're uh, not, not being allowed to be touched by the Spirit of God in our lives? I thought about the idea of a caring friend here, the power of a caring friend. Are there people in your life that could analyze this for you, that you could talk to, that you could say, this is what's going on, uh, how would you evaluate me? Um, what would a neutral party say if you opened up to them about what was really going on? As I was preparing the message this morning, or for this morning, one of my primary concerns as I was working through it is that this would come across as heavy, uh, like uh, hard. And I, I don't intend to, I don't think that's the right message. Uh, because after all, we're talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit here <laughs> in the life of the believer. Somehow it ought to be overwhelmingly encouraging. The beautiful thing about our passage this morning is it not only promises victory over sin, and provides us with these measuring tools about uh, the result of where we're going, but it also provides us a process for success, for being victor victorious over sin in our life. And that's our fourth point this morning, the provision for victory over sin, and that's verses 24 and 25. Let's read those verses together. It says this, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So is the Christian life merely this exhausting tug of war between these two voices in our life? Is that what it's supposed to be? I would say absolutely not. That's not what's intended. And in these verses, uh, Paul declares to us a process for overcoming that, a process for living by the Spirit in our life. And this process that he gives us is twofold. First, he talks about the mortification of sin or this daily dying to the flesh. And secondly, he uses an, uh, we're going to use another big word. It's this idea of vivification. And that is the continuous growth in grace through new life in the Spirit. So first, let's talk about this process of mortification. When you look back to, or when you look at verse 24, this idea of being crucified, uh, it's very easy to go back to Galatians 2.20. That passage says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It would be very easy to look at these two verses and this verse in chapter 5 and that verse in chapter 2 and say they're the same thing, and they are not. Uh, Paul is referring to two very different things when he's talking about this idea. In chapter 2, Paul is talking about the idea of what was done for us and to us in the process of salvation, that uh, the that that we are now dead. Our old man is now dead, and it's on the cross. The law has now been nailed to the cross uh, in this process of salvation. But in chapter 5, uh, it's very different. There's more of an active construction 
uh, to these words. And it's not what is done for us and to us, but is what is done by us uh, as Christians. Believers themselves are the agents of this chapter 5 crucifixion. Paul here was describing a process called mortification, and that is the daily putting to death of the flesh through the disciplines of prayer, fasting, repentance, and self-control. We are not to merely take up our cross, but we are to ensure that the execution occurs. One commentator words it this way. He says, crucifixion produced death, not suddenly, but gradually. True Christians do not succeed in completely destroying the flesh while here below, but they have fixed it to the cross, and they are determined to keep it there until it expires. The second part of this process is this process of vivification. Uh, In this verse, in verse 25 now, uh, Paul uses what's called an indicative imperative style uh, to deliver this message of vivification. And what that means is it's a truth followed by a command. So here, the, the truth is that if we live by the Spirit, that is, if we are saved by grace through faith, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's the truth. What is the result of that truth, or what's the related command? And that is that in light of this truth, we are to obey the command to keep in step with the Spirit. We are to keep in step with the Spirit. What's that mean? Well, that idea of keep in step with the Spirit is a military term, and it means to obey a command. It means to uh, keep in, or to stand in line, or to stand in a row. In philosophical terms, it would mean to follow someone's principles. In other words, it is the believer's responsibility to desire to live a Christ-like life. It depends upon the Holy Spirit, or to depend on the Holy Spirit for the power to live that life and to step out in faith and live it. This, was, this fulfilled will bring all the infinite fruits Uh, of the Spirit to aid the believer and to put in operation all of the activities of the Spirit on his behalf. We're getting close to the end here. And as I'm concluding, as I was thinking through uh, uh, these ideas this morning, it strikes me that uh, as we talk about this, this process of success, that it might be real easy to say, wait a minute, uh, this, this feels a little flat. Uh, you, you over-promised, under-delivered. Um, you promised this solution that I could follow, and at the end of that solution, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit lost. Uh, it doesn't feel like enough. Um, my answer to that relates to how common it is for us to miss all that we have in Christ. And it reminds me of the circumstances in the movie Up, Um, this animated film uh, about a man named Carl Fredrickson. And uh, Carl Fredrick, the movie opens with Carl as a young boy. And as a young boy, Carl meets this girl named Ellie. And uh, they uh, fall in love based on this shared uh, desire and and love for adventure uh, in their life. And so they get married with great plans for adventure. And as that happens, trouble happens. And uh, uh, there's bills to pay, there's work to do, uh, there's health issues along the way. And they had to set aside this dream that they had of going to Paradise Falls and, uh, and, and, and not live out this, this apparent adventure that they were going to have. Along the way, they grow old, and uh, Ellie eventually dies. And uh, Carl decides that, uh, feeling very guilty, that he had not provided this adventure that he was supposed to provide, decides that he's going to live out this adventure and that he's going to go to Paradise Falls. So that uh, the story takes on a kind of a wild turn and it involves a million balloons on top of a house and he's going to fly this house to Paradise Falls. And along the way, uh, just everything goes wrong. Uh, It's just a dismal um, adventure. 
And uh, so finally at the end, with the house dilapidated and falling apart, Carl is sitting there in the house, and his eye catches his wife's scrapbook that she had maintained through her life. And he opens it up and he starts pedaling through it. And, it. and it started with all of those things when she was a little girl about the adventure she would have. And he didn't know it, but she had added to the scrapbook. And she had started adding what happened after they were married. Because for Ellie, all those hardships, all those things that were happening were part of the adventure. And finally, at the end of the story, uh, or at the end of the scrapbook, uh, Carl turns the page and it says, thanks for the adventure. Now go start another one. And I think the same thing is true in the life of us as believers, is that we have all <laughs> the answer already inside of us and we don't even know it. Uh, we are saved by no means of our own, but only through the grace and mercy of God. We are free from the burden of the law and the impossible problem of working to impress our God by our actions. We are a new creature in Christ. We are given this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit who now resides in us, desires to influence us, and provides us with an understanding and ability to live like Christ. We even know because of the influence of this Holy Spirit in our life, that this sort of life that He encouraged us toward results in the true joy and peace that we're seeking after all. We just have to do it. So how do I apply these things? Well, first to unbelievers. If uh, you're listening this morning and you don't know what it means to actually believe in Christ, to rely on Him uh, for your salvation, uh, I would encourage you this morning to seek someone out. Uh, this is eternally important. And uh, I would encourage you to talk to virtually any member here uh, should be prepared to talk to you about what it means uh, to be a believer in Christ. But second to the believer, often as Christians, especially in a conservative environment like this, uh, with uh, conservative theology, uh, we don't think a lot or consider the tremendous impact of the Holy Spirit's presence uh, in our life, His indwelling in us. We often think tangibly, logically, intellectually, but today is an invitation uh, to cultivate that voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not so much by saying that uh, I'm going to work at being gracious or I'm going to work at uh, being faithful this week, that would be the wrong idea. That's absolutely, that would be uh, almost living by the flesh. But instead, uh, in cultivating this life in the Holy Spirit, of walking and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? First, we must crucify the fleshly desires that desire our attention and make no provision for them. Second, we must live a life of repentance, turning towards God constantly. We must desire to make Christ the delight of our lives. Well, how? Through the Word, through obedience, through good inputs uh, within just even this local body uh, in our life, and through edifying relationships. And then we must be those edifying relationships to those around us as well. So as we conclude here, I'm going to ask the music team to come back up, and we're going to be singing. I'd just like you to, to take time uh, to think through uh, these ideas in this passage. <laughs>